Welcome to BrooklynComicShop.com, your place for exclusive autographed comics, original artwork, and more. This past Saturday, September 23, 2017, was Batman Day, and BrooklynComicShop.com was on hand to attend the Frank Miller Batman Dark Knight The Master Race signing, held at Barnes & Noble in Union Square in New York City. Frank Miller was joined by fellow writer Brian Azzarello, artist Andy Kubert, inker Klaus Janssen, and colorist Brad Anderson. The event included a 25-minute moderated discussion, followed by a signing of the hardcover graphic novel of Batman the Master Race, commonly known as DK3. BrooklynComicShop.com was able to capture about 10 minutes of the lecture to share with Batman fans worldwide. Enjoy! Bring the sports colors, Andy. I like it. I like the t-shirt. Very nice. I do. <laughs> he is the Inker's Inker, and he has been working with Frank Miller going way back to the 80s on Daredevil. And once again, he is back for the third chapter of the Dark Knight saga. Ladies and gentlemen, Klaus Jansen. <laughs> piece of our five-piece puzzle today is the man who brought the incredible color palette to Dark Knight 3. Colorist Brad Anderson. <laughs> Let's get started. Thank you. you guys all for making the time to be here. You know, I'll start with you and, uh, and Brian Frank. You know, it's a Dark Knight story, but to me, and I think to a lot of readers, this isn't as much a Carrie Kelly story as it was a Batman story. Can you talk about how you and Brian worked together and, and cracked the story initially? We, had, we, uh, we came in with baseball bats and we had the side of the room and started swinging. Um, that would bounce the ideas back and forth, like, like uh, people who just enjoy putting puzzles together, but also enjoy playing with these wonderful toys. That have been that have been around a long time, but seem to keep staying fresh. It doesn't. It, it's 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 kind of amazing how enduring all these characters are. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, it's a it's a Carrie Kelly and a, and a Lara story. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a you know it's a story about uh, fathers and daughters. And yeah. Since it's, it's neither of us have daughters, I don't know why we decided. <laughs> 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 Lara's rebellion I is the story, that, right? right? I mean, Lara's the most rebellious teenager in the history yeah. of ever, yeah. and, it, and also she happens to be a superpowered Kryptonian. Yes. Um, so, talk about how you guys figured out working her and making her such a central part of the story. It did itself. Yeah, I mean, it just seemed natural after Dark Knight 2. It's like, in, in Dark Knight 2, for me, she was the the real, uh, the character I identify with, I guess, because I think people are hands, too. And, um, right? <laughs> this is a tough room. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, talk about uh, your approach to drawing Carrie and Larry, these two separate characters. Let's get back to this. <laughs> is that what you think of artists? No, no. They're like fleas. <laughs> Publisher. Lapdogs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, so tell me about your approach. Uh, you come on board the book and you start getting the, the script from Brian and Frank. Tell me about your approach to, uh, to bring Carrie to life. She's a little older now, she's more experienced, so it's a different character. Uh, my main approach was not to screw it up. That was pretty much my main <laughs> approach. Um, you know, she was described as, you know, 14, 16 years old, you know, girl. Uh, Frank and I traded drawings back and forth, you know, got his idea of it, I traded back and forth with him. And uh, it just went from there. Like Brian said, it, it, it kind of carries a life on its own when you start it. Um, same with the rendering on, on the characters themselves, you know. Uh, well, a lot of people ask me, you know, if I purposely went in that direction, in Frank's direction, and to a certain extent I did. But those characters and the character designs that Frank had kind of lent itself to that look. Uh, 
Yeah, that, that's pretty much the way all the things went down. Now. Frank, did you have uh, any aside from these designs? Were there any other art notes for for Andy Klaus um, when when uh, coming up with designs here? I'm wondering because there's a specific look to the Dark Knight universe that's a little bit different than the other Batman books. Yeah. No. I'm not gonna tell this guy what to do. Yeah, we got out of the way. Yeah, it's, it's, when you got Andy Kubert and Miles, you're not, you're not, um, you know, it's, 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 oh, like if I should get the chance to, to work again um, with, with either of them, I will learn, I will learn from them in China. So the collaboration is when, it's when you when each are getting things from each other now. Um, there, was, there, was, there was a lot of influence. Believe me, big time as far as design, approach, storytelling. He's being very modest. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of influence. Hey, nobody ever called me modest. <laughs> <laughs> Klaus, what's the biggest difference between inking Andy on this book and Frank on the on the previous two? May I hide now? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think uh, Andy and Frank. Uh, you know, mentioned that there are certain similarities uh, between the two of them. I think uh, both of them are extremely, uh, uh, let's say, uh, professional uh, storytellers in the sense that they absolutely know how to tell a story. You know, the differences uh, might be in a very simple way that Frank's pencils are a little bit more angular and uh, Andy's pencils are a little bit more round. So when I ink Frank, I try to bring a little bit of smoothness to Frank's uh, pencils. And when I ink Andy, I try to bring a little angularity to it. And we sort of meet in the middle. Um, and, uh, you know, I think Andy's right. You know, you hope you don't screw it up. Uh, okay. Brad, tell me about the, the approach that you took here, because the color palette that you see in this book throughout the nine issues is pretty extraordinary. From the darkness of Gotham City to the harsh colors whenever the Kandorians are, are around. Yeah, it was, um, I really played off Andy's art, uh, the heavy blocks. And normally, how I would start approaching this is he did some amazing establishing shots, uh, these vast landscape cityscapes. So I, I would kind of put color into the sky and the sky would kind of translate where my palette's going to go, and the action's going to be. There was a heavy scenes of red, of blood, and stuff like that. So that kind of helped my decisions for backgrounds. Too. But yeah, it was interesting. You know, they're talking about the action in the, in the story. There's a ton of action here. Once the main story really takes off, I mean, it's epic. Feels very old school comic. You know, e epic. And Frank, you and I have talked about this before, like, where some of the other, where the other two Dark Knight stories, nihilism and pessimism, there's some hope here in this story in, that you don't really see in the first two chapters of the Dark Knight stories. Well, I thought they were a regular um, cheerful run. <laughs> <laughs> how much of that is from you and how much of that is from Ryan? The, the difference in tone. Hope? From me? <laughs> Come on! No one's buying this act, Ryan. Well, I'm Mary Sunshine, so it must have been for me. <laughs> you know, Mike, if I may say, I think that all three of them end with a hopeful note. Yes. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, we go through a lot of uh, pain and drama, but at the end of each one, there is a forward looking. Uh, ending. Absolutely. To, 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 to say specifically about the first two, at the end of the first one, he, he goes from he goes from thinking at the very beginning of the story about how he could have a good death to, to the end of the story. He's thinking about looking forward to a good life. Sorry, that is not a pessimistic ending. And, and in the second Dark Knight, he's, he's obsessing about his age. And in his last line, we've blown up the bat cave. And he said, he, he says, I was sentimental back when I was old. These are not, these are not gloomy endings. Yeah. And plus, when we wrote this story, one of the things we wanted to do was rehabilitate Superman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, Let's yeah, talk about I, Superman you know, here. You know, it's like, 
Do you ever feel like a bum on a china shop? Um, no, it, it, it's a, when I, when I um, in, the, in the first dark night, and then in the second, it was, it was, it was uh, I don't know, I got so much of uh, thinking about Batman and him being the big guy, and how, how just basically, just how conservative Superman had gotten over the years. And since I was on Batman's team, he became the, 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 the big fight, the big showdown. And then, then I really went out of my way to humiliate the poor guy in the second one. And uh, somewhere along the line, I, somebody reminded me that I loved the character. And, and, uh, and then, you know, we, we, we kind of got to talk. And you could be too mean on the guy. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video. Check out our website for exclusive comics, including Frank Miller signed Batman The Dark Knight Returns and Daredevil Comics. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram at Brooklyn Comic Shop.